Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're really delighted to be joined by a terrific guest, uh, Reverend Susan Hayward. Um, Reverend Hayward is the uh, Associate Director for Religious Literacy and the Professions Initiative at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, has a really interesting background. She's a native of Minneapolis. Uh, grew up there, um, went to undergrad at Tufts University, and then has a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and also the Harvard Divinity School. She's an ordained minister, excuse me, in the United Church of Christ. Um, she's had a great academic background. She's she's actually worked at the U.S. Institute of Peace, um, taught at Georgetown and George Washington, and also now teaches at the Foreign Service Institute, does some lecturing there, teaching incoming uh, diplomats about uh, the world of religious literacy and religion and international affairs. So we're looking forward to a really wide-ranging conversation about her work at the Harvard Divinity School, um, and importance of uh, religion and foreign policy and public policy, and also the concept of religious literacy, which is really important for all of us. And Susie is joining us from her hometown in Minneapolis, where I think it's a little warmer today than it might often be in January. So Susie, good, good afternoon. It's great to be here, John. Thank you. And it's maybe a little bit warmer, but it's still pretty cold, but it's gorgeous here. We're, we're just draped in snow, and I couldn't be happier to, to see the winter wonderland out the window. <laughs> great. Well, Susie, tell us about your interest in religious studies. I know you you studied comparative religions, I think, as an undergrad. Was this always kind of the academic uh, discipline that called you and kind of attracted your interest and passions? Absolutely not. I had no idea what I was getting myself in for when I registered for my first course on religion in college. I actually went to college, I think, in my admissions applications I said that I wanted to study Russian literature, um, but when I got to school, I sort of, I enrolled in a philosophy of religion class my freshman year because it sounded interesting, it fit one of the requirements that I needed to meet for, for my bachelor's degree, and I was immediately sucked in by, by the study, the academic study of religion. I found it really fascinating, and in retrospect, now I look back and I see the ways in which Growing up, I was always very curious about the different religious traditions around me, particularly here in Minneapolis. There's a large immigrant and refugee population. And so I was exposed to a lot of different religions and always very curious about it. So it makes sense in retrospect, but I have I would not have foreseen that when I went into college. Did you have a, like a particular professor who, you know, particularly captured your imagination or or, or a class that ignited a particular interest? I mean, all of my professors in the religion department at Tufts were amazing. And um, actually, a number of them are still in my phone and my contact list, and I stay in touch with them. I think there's also something about the study of religion that um, immediately invites a kind of intimacy in classroom conversations that can happen in other disciplines as well, but seems to sort of naturally happen because you're at you're discussing fundamental questions of meaning and because many folks have very personal experiences of or feelings about um, the quote unquote religious questions. And so that 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 creates uh, an experience in the classroom that can really lead to some really deep relationships with fellow students, but also with your professors. But again, it was that the first class I took was a philosophy of religion class. And um, so we were looking at questions, you know, related to the, the relationship between faith and reason, um, about different kinds of philosophical questions about evil. In theological language, we have the term theodicy. Um, so why does evil exist? What purpose does evil serve if it does serve a purpose? Um, and I found those questions fascinating. The next course I took was an introductory course on comparative religion. And then that that really began to expose expose me to the different this the the study of different kinds of religious traditions and how different religious stories, religious cultures grapple with some of those really fundamental questions. And interestingly, Tufts is um, well known for its international relations major. That's what the majority of students pursue there. And I, I consider doing international relations as well. But I went to the first class 
introduction to international relations. And I just found it so dull to learn about international law and the international system. Now I went on to get a master's degree at Tufts in international relations. So I ended up, you know, swallowing all that, um, that medicine that I needed to, in order to be able to understand how to navigate the international system. But I actually found that comparative, the comparative religion classrooms allowed me to, to focus on the, the angle in which I wanted to understand international or intercultural relations. So how different um, nations, not necessarily in the state nation understand, but nations in the sense of imagined communities or, um, or just communities around the world, make decisions about right and wrong, decide to order their societies, the stories of meaning that they use to shape their communal lives and, and even their political lives and, and so on. I found that a the, 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 through the doorway of religion, um, a much more fascinating entryway to understanding uh, global relations. Well, so then what was your journey from, from Tufts as an undergrad to the Fletcher School and then Harvard Divinity School? Did that, what was that progression? Yeah, so um, at Tufts, I ended up, again, it was a comparative religion degree. And so um, I was interested to an extent on some of these questions around politics and human rights and sociology and feminism and so on and religion. But the primary focus in comparative religion was, was understanding different religious traditions and the ways in which they mutually shape or interact with one another. So it, it wasn't a primary focus on the intersection of politics and religion necessarily. But I was a human rights activist. So I had all growing up um, here in Minneapolis, I had been involved in a lot of human rights activism. And in college, I continued to be engaged in that, that kind of international justice movement work. Uh, I didn't necessarily see a clear relationship between my academic study of religion and the human rights work that I was doing until I did my study abroad in Nepal. And there I was living with the Tibetan refugee community in a neighborhood of Kathmandu called Bodhna. And um, I was doing a, a program where we were sort of studying Buddhism and practicing it regularly. So we were waking up every morning and meditating for 45 minutes and we were doing circumambulations and participating in the ritual life of the, the Buddhist community there. Um, but it was at a time when the Maoist insurgency was um, was really growing around Nepal. And so there was increasing tensions and, and episodes of violence that were happening. And it was very interesting to me to see the ways in which religions, and there's you know a multitude of religious identities and practices in Nepal, but the ways in which religions were serving as both a connector and a divider between the communities there, a source of tension and some at some times and a source of coming together because Nepalis will show up for often, many Nepalis will show up for basically any religious celebration they can, whatever the religious tradition doesn't matter, as long as it's an opportunity to be on the streets and frolicking. Um, and so it was interesting to see religion as this means that by which people came together, but also sometimes this source of tension. Uh, and it was particularly for me living with the Tibetan Buddhist community and seeing the role that religion played for them in exile in making sense of political violence that they had experienced, um, in creating a sense of social cohesion in, in exile and so on. That I it was it's through that experience that I really began to see some of these um, intersections between questions related to justice and violence and religion. So that's a long way to get to answering your question, which is that. After I graduated from Tufts, I, uh, I came back to Minneapolis and I was working here for a while doing uh, political asylum work. And what really struck me, my job it was with Minnesota Advocates for Human Rights. They're now called Advocates for Human Rights, a really great organization that amongst their many great programs, one of them is, a, is an immigrant and refugee program that connects pro bono lawyers in the Twin Cities with those who are applying for political asylum. And my job was to do the intake interviews, to, to listen to these folks who had experienced some pretty horrific things in their home countries um, and made it here to the US and to listen to their stories to see if it might fit the legal criteria in the US for being able to get political asylum. And what just kept 
striking me in these conversations was how much religion came up, no matter what their religious background, you know, it was, and in very ambivalent ways. So it came up because something about their religious identity made them a target in their home country. It came up because where they found safe sanctuary in their home country or when they made it to the U.S. had something to do with a religious community or a religious space. Um, and it came up in um, in more ephemeral ways in, in how they talked with hope about moving forward in the aftermath of these experiences of loss um, and, and violence was often infused by religious or spiritual language from their culture, from their traditions. Uh, and I, I just became, again, more and more fascinated about this intersection of the real complexity and ambivalence of religion and these episodes of political violence and the humans in the midst of them trying to find security, trying to move forward, trying to find meaning, um, trying to determine how to respond. So that's what then led me to go into graduate school. I mean, I, I did a little bit of work in DC too during that time and in refugee policy work with the United Nations. But after that, I went to the Divinity School in order to really dig into this relationship between religion and violence and peace building. And after a year and a half there at the Divinity School, uh, I realized it would be in my best interest to go back over to Tufts and enroll in those international relations classes in order to have a better sense of the international system and the legal system and um, the actual practical skills of developing peace programming and monitoring and evaluating it and and this sort of thing. So I combined those two degrees and uh, and spent some time working for a couple different organizations in order to understand the practical work of peace building with in religious spaces with religious actors and institutions. And before I then landed at my position at the U.S. Institute of Peace, where I was for 14 years. Right. Well, I, I saw one uh, interview you did um, on YouTube, and you were talking about Harvard Divinity School, and you were talking about its value and just giving you sub substantial knowledge about religious traditions. But you also said it helped you think, find a way to think and move in the world. Talk about the, the how how Harvard Divinity School shaped you. Yeah, I would love to. So. Um, you know, it, part of what we call religious literacy is about understanding um, the content of different religious traditions, right? It's about understanding the five pillars in Islam. It's about understanding what's the difference between Theravada and Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism. Um, it's about understanding primary religious holidays and gender norms and and forms of governance that are considered um, right or just in different religious traditions and so on. And that's all important. But another aspect of religious literacy that, that we talk about in the program that I'm with now at the Divinity School of Religion and Public Life is about understanding um, that religion and these questions of meaning and justice um, that are often at the heart of religion, that shape religions, that motivate religions, they intersect with all different aspects of human life. We sort of, um, we're, we're given something of a myth in by the European Enlightenment era that religion is this private sphere of life that can be um, sort of uh, sectioned off from politics, from, from, from social dynamics, from economics and so on, and can exist over here just in the household or just within the mosque or the gudwara or the, or the church. But reality is that religion, um, like culture, it infuses so many different aspects of politics and governance and economics and society. And, um, and studying religion kind of invites you to ask particular kinds of questions about how certain norms or commitments underlie a lot of these things that we think of as, as being universal or we think of as being sort of um, what we call secular or neutral about particular cultural and religious commitments. And so that's what I mean by the study of religion invited me to think and move in the world in different ways, is it invited me to think about these, these larger questions of meaning of the human at the heart of so much, of ethics, um, and questions of power, and questions of justice, and, and then 
you know, to determine how to move within the, like asking those questions of the international system. Then when I went over to the Fletcher School and understanding how to move within the international system and international law with that sort of deeper and critical um, gaze and engagement that has, I think, been really enriching. Well, you, you mentioned the U.S. P, uh, Institute of Peace, which you worked at for 14 years. And I know I, I in my earlier life, I did some profiles of people who worked at USIP, as it's called. And what an interesting place that began. I mean, its, it's initial aspiration was sort of for a kind of a, a sweeping peace academy along the lines of West Point or Annapolis. As politics intruded, it became a much smaller uh, you know, initially a very small think tank, but it's gone on to do some really remarkable and creative things. So talk about your, your time at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Yes, and kudos to you, John, for knowing what it is and even more about its origins than a lot of folks do. Um, indeed, it did have, you know, there, there's actually a faith-based uh, account of the creation of USIP because there were a lot of those within the Just Peace Churches um, or the historic peace churches like the the Church of the Brethren or the Quakers or the Mennonites who were involved in the lobbying effort that led to the creation of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, but it's, it was essentially created in, in 1984 in order to support the professionalization of the field of peace building in order to inform U.S. foreign policymakers about nonviolent, non-military means to address conflict. And while it didn't become an academy along the lines of a West Point, um, where we send 18-year-olds and they develop the, the skills and the knowledge to be able to support negotiations and peace processes around the world and then, and then serve in the State Department or within the international system. It did play a big role in developing some of the peace and justice programs within universities. There was a peace and justice program at, at Tufts when I went there and I, I took one class there and I remember that a number of the different textbooks that I, that I read were published by USIP. Um, and then it's it's grown significantly since 1984, and it now has offices around the world, um, still paid by U.S. taxpayers, still, you know, a creation of the U.S. Congress and supported by the U.S. Congress. But what led me there was that, that period that I was living in D.C. that I mentioned quickly after college and before grad school, um, I was spending a lot of time going to different public events uh, at think tanks and, and other centers and agencies and bureaus during my free time. And I went to a number of different events at USIP that were hosted by its religion program. And one thing that struck me is um, at, at the time, it stood apart in how they were thinking and talking about religion. This was not long after 9-11 and the extent to which religion was being discussed in DC, it tended to be a focus on Islam and it tended to be a focus on religion as purely a negative force, religion as a barrier to peace, as a threat to security, as um, a, a threat to justice and human rights. And again, with sort of a, a particular infatuation or accusations that were made about Islam in, in that respect. And what I found at USIP and its religion program is it was a much more um, broad understanding of, you know, again, what Scott Appleby refers to as the ambivalence of the sacred, the ways in which religious ideas and actors and institutions in any given context, there's a great deal of internal diversity within religious traditions and within religious communities. And there's going to be ways in which religious ideas and actors and institutions are um, being sort of leveraged or drawn on to justify a full range of human and social and political and economic behavior for good or bad uh, in how we define good or bad in support of peace or in, in support of, of violence. And I appreciated that the religion program is doing that. It was also created, at the religion program at USIP, I should qualify. It was also created in 1987. So um, long before 9-11. And I think that's part of the reason too, that that it sort of from the beginning had a much broader understanding, look at a range of different religious traditions and not caught up in some of the security frame and um, and commitments in the, in the post 9-11 era. So that's what, what drew me in. And I actually went to the director of the religion program at the time, David Smock, and I said, 
what would I need to do if I wanted to work at an organization like this and work in this field? And he said, go get a degree in religion, advanced degree in religion, get an advanced degree in con international conflict resolution, and international relations, spend some time on the ground in a conflict zone, supporting peace building efforts, working with religious actors, and then you should be good. So I went and I did all those things. And then a position opened up in the religion program at USIP. And I went back to David and I said, I did what you said, here I am. <laughs> and he took me on. And then I was there for, as he said, 14 years. Well, one of the big projects you did was a, a project which led itself, which became a book that you edited called Women, Religion, and Peace Building, Illuminating the Unseen. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, so... When I joined the religion program at the Institute, I was the first woman to be in like a program officer, a program manager, program development role. And, um, and I didn't come in necessarily thinking about some of the gendered assumptions or consequences of the work of religious peace building. But when you're a woman operating in that space and you're the sort of first woman to be coming into and looking at some of the projects and programs we're developing, I think I brought a certain kind of certain kinds of questions or considerations based on my experience. And then, you know, two, like when you're working already the space of international security, um, at least in the past, but I would argue still today is is very male dominated. Um, in a lot of the top top leadership. And there's been movements like with UN Security Council Resolution 1325, for example, to bring greater attention to the perspectives and the priorities of women in violent conflict and in and peace initiatives that need to be taken seriously. Um, and some of the larger questions related to gender because those of different genders experience violent con conflict in different ways. And, and so again, have different priorities. Um, so you're bringing the field of international security, which is already fairly sort of male dominated, but then you're layering on top of that, the, the field of religion, where in a lot of places around the world and in a lot of religious traditions, there's not as much authority that is given to women in a formal sense as uh, leaders, clerical leaders of religion, for example, far more than people think, actually, and that's part of the the subtitle of our book, Illuminating the Unseen, is that there are a lot of women who do have some formal clerical roles from, you know, Islamic judges um, to uh, Buddhist nuns and Catholic nuns and so on who, who have some significant formal authority um, that's that's not always recognized. But yes, there's there were times when I was sometimes felt like I was the only woman in the room, in a room full of um uh, imams who I'm working with in Iraq, for example, or when I'm in an international organizational space talking about issues related to security. So I very quickly started to ask questions about what are the foundational theories that have shaped the field of religion, violence, and peace or religious peace building? Um, and what are some of the assumptions that are connected to gender that might be operating in some of those dominant theories and that have shaped how we do religious peace building. Are we ensuring that we're taking into account um, the priorities of women that might be slightly different, for example, sexual and uh, gender-based violence that, that is often rampant in situations of violent conflict? Is that being addressed as fulsomely as it could be or should be by religious actors? And that could be religious actors' involvement in addressing that issue could be incredibly transformational. So it was, it was my own experience that then led me to begin to ask these questions and to um, begin to look for, meet up with, connect with, support um, some pretty incredible women women leaders of peace building who were connected with their religious communities in in some way and in doing their work through faith-based organizations, through religious institutions, um, in partnership with other women of faith from different religious traditions, to really begin to point an analysis towards what how they were doing their work and what was distinctive about the ways that they did their work that could offer lessons to ensure that religious peace building effort was going to be not necessarily unintentionally um, reinforce forms of gender injustice, but could could ensure it's supporting sustainable peace for all people of all different genders. 
I was uh, recently talking to a, a man who is um, a diplomat who, who was working on peace efforts in Darfur. This is 2000, 2000, 2007 and eight. And he was telling the story that they, you know, the, the things were horribly stalemated and he was trying to have a broader inclusion of civil society and pushed really hard to have a number of the women leaders, you know, entering into the discussions. And he said he was able to do that. And it was really striking because, you know, in some of them, the kind of the cliches about women being more conciliatory. And I mean, he thought was true and very, very constructive. But he said the ones that he dealt with were also incredibly open, honest, sort of obfuscation that had maybe occurred in some of the earlier discussions was just obliterated. He said it just brought a whole new dimension into the talks in a way that was even more than he anticipated. I mean, yeah. is that experience common or things that you, something you have seen before? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, it, I'm not surprised to hear that. I think it, it does reflect when you bring, especially when a peace process has been really stalemated, it's been going on for a long time and it's kind of going in in circles. When you bring in a whole new constituency, you're immediately going to have a fresh perspective. But I think it's also in a lot of these places, um, women aren't part of the, they're not benefiting from the status quo. <laughs> and so they're also far more likely to be willing to challenge the status quo and to be able to make some innovative and creative ideas um, that can that can that can really like the status quo in especially in protracted conflict situations has evolved so that it fuels the ongoing conflict. Political norms, social norms, economic norms are feeding are being fed by the conflict and then in turn are feeding the conflict. So when you've been people in who aren't as invested in, they're not benefiting from the status quo, then yeah, they're gonna be able to kind of challenge it in a way that can, especially when the wheels are spinning, can help get it off track. A couple other things that I've just found really fascinating from the conversations that I had from, with women religious peace builders around the world. One, you know, there's, um, I mean, first of all, one thing I'll say is that, yes, there are ways in which women's um, experiences and their position can lead them to be far more willing to reach across lines of difference um, to be able to try to seek kind of pragmatic solution to ensure their kids can get to school that, you know, that they're not facing the same level of violence to, to themselves and to their communities and so on, um, that can make them, you know, quote unquote, more, more conciliatory and, and open and, and innovative and so on. And there are also women, just like religion is ambivalent, right? So there's also ways in which we limit, uh, women can be very powerfully involved in forms of nationalism and um, cults of martyrdom and fueling forms of exclusionary understanding within their own communities, you know, gatekeeping on who their children can marry and, and purveying certain sorts of ideas that can fuel bias and prejudice and so on um, and supporting armed movements and so on. So women are not a monolithic either. But a couple of the things I found really fascinating about um, the women who are involved in this work, one is that we, we, we certainly saw there was a lot of interfaith work that happened that women were involved in. They just naturally seemed to want to do work with um, women of other religious traditions and to learn from them, to develop partnerships with them. So you saw this, you know, in Israel, Palestine, there's a lot of women's networks across lines of division in Sri Lanka. Um, and in Colombia and, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I found, and of course I should say, Lema Gaboi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner in Liberia, it's a wonderful and powerful example of that kind of interfaith work. So the, they're the Christian and Muslim women who came together in order to really end the civil war and push forward that peace process when it had become stalemated. But one thing we found is it wasn't, it wasn't just about um, you know, kind of soft relationship building and wanting to develop relationships and um, uh, 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 sort of a uh, lack of prejudice or bigotry necessarily, um, but it was as much pragmatic. It was a, them recognizing that they didn't have as much social and political power as women. And so they needed to form these kinds of coalitions across lines of difference in order to be able to really mobilize community to put pressure on political leaders. And here again, that case of Liberia is a strong one where it was because Lema Gaboe reached out to the Muslim community members and the Muslim community members reached out to her as well as a Christian leader that they were able to form that 
um, Christian Muslim Women's Alliance that was incredibly powerful because of the numbers that they had uh, from those from members of those two different communities that then allowed them to have greater political and social influence. So um, I could go on and on about the women who are involved in the in this work, but I'll send you to my book if you want to hear more stories from around the world and about what makes the their work distinctive and what that has to offer and thinking about the larger questions of the relationship between religion and violence and peace as well. Well, I will track down that book. I, I was, <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about um, religion and, and public life program at Harvard Divinity School. And I looked on your on the website and I, I came across a white paper that was written by someone else. It wasn't written by you a, a couple of years ago, but I want to read a couple sentences and maybe have you sort of play off um, the language. It, and it's a white paper for staff. And it reads, religion is a powerful force in human experience. From the beginnings of human history into our contemporary moment, religious convictions continue to inspire, to continue to inspire terrible acts of violence, as well as profound acts of courage, compassion, and imagination. And it goes on to say, we believe that promoting a nuanced and capacious understanding of religion provides tools to mitigate the destructive power of religion enhance its ability to generate compassion, beauty, and just peace building. So tell us about this program, um, the, the Religion and Public Life program, and then the, the particular program that you're the associate director of uh, pertaining to uh, religious literacy. Yeah, thanks, John. So um, that those words were written by Diane Moore, who is the faculty director and the originator of the Religion and Public Life program. It's actually the descendant of something that was called the Religious Literacy Program that existed for many years that, that Dr. Moore led, um, that was working with a range of professionals in what we traditionally think of as secular professions that have ostensibly nothing to do with religion in order to help them better understand how religion was shaping was shaping uh, the work that they were doing and how they could think about that as they pursued their their um, their their justice goals within their professions. So religion and public life then was established in October 2020 and um, and it has a, a focus on our students first and foremost at the Divinity School. So it was out of recognition that a lot of the students who are going into graduate study of religion, these days at, at the Divinity School and, in, and I think other Divinity Schools um, would, would probably cite this as well. They're not necessarily interested in going into traditional forms of ministry, nor going into the academic study of religion and becoming professors. They're um, drawn to the study of religion and to divinity school because of their commitments to making the world a better place and their justice commitments. But they're planning on going into careers of service in some way, whether it's community organizing or humanitarianism, or like I did, going into peace building and diplomacy and so on. And so the program was created in order to help them think about how do I take my study of religion into government work in ways that are going to be helpful in formulating policy around issues like um, urban land use or climate or um, racial justice or any of these things. How can my study religion help me ensure that I'm creating policies that are going to be effective and that are going to be inclusive? Um, and so on across a different range. So we have a certificate program that they can pursue. We also, and this gets back to the sort of the original vision of the, the religious literacy program, and then your question about what I do with my initiative in the religious literacy and professions, that's um, continuing that work of engaging with professionals uh, across a range of different professions. So public policy, education, secondary education, um, humanitarianism, journalism, and media, and so on. In order to, to help enhance their religious literacy, and what we mean by religious literacy, again, it's not, it's not just or even not, not primarily about what's the difference between Sunni and Shia Islam, about sort of the, the content of religion, but it's more about how do we, how do, what kinds of questions do we ask, and how do we understand the ways in which religious commitments and religious understandings are shaping public policy, communities' responses to it, or public health. An example I often give is with COVID, right? What if, what if our public health officials had from the beginning been thinking about religion with respect to how the virus might spread, with respect to how people might respond to, um, to shutdown, to the vaccination movement, and so on? If some of that 
preemptive thinking about those religious dimensions had been in place, might it have been able to better help us mitigate the spread of the virus and ensure um, less of a backlash against the vaccination movement. So that's that's what we're doing in the in the religion public life program. And I think it's really, I mean, part of the reason I came back from USIP uh, to the Divinity School to be a part of this program is I think it's it has an incredible amount of potential to help us with um, thinking in new ways about how to address some of these just fundamental crises that we're facing in the world, whether it's about uh, the democratic crises that we're facing or climate collapse um, or forms of persistent racial justice and so on. How can asking questions related to religion help us analyze think about these issues in new way and potentially help create um, partnerships and ways of moving forward that might be different from the solutions we've used in that past that that haven't been working. Well, I saw you mad, I moderate a panel, which I think that there was a young man who said, okay, once I become uh, religiously literate, and then he asked a question and he, he kind of smiled and he said, okay, you know, none of us ever becomes completely <laughs> religiously literate. It's a process. It's not a destination. It's not like you get a certificate. So, so play off that. I'm thinking about some of your work with, with American diplomats and the Foreign Service Institute. When you talk to them in a kind of a practical way about religious literacy and like diplomacy and representing the United States in Sri Lanka or Colombia, I mean, what are sort of the practical insights, tools, observations that you like to impart upon them? Yeah. So one thing I have them do um, as an exercise at the beginning of, of each time that I give this particular lecture to the in, with the incoming class of Foreign Service officers, that's just kind of an intro to thinking about religion and conflict and peace. I start um, at the beginning with a poll and I say, I'm going to give you a statement and I want you to answer whether you strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. And the statement is religion has created more um, has contributed more to violence and injustice in the modern era than it has to peace and justice. And people answer the poll and then we anonymously, and then we put up the results. And inevitably there's a strong um, set of folks or, or preference for the agree or strongly agree. There's always a few people who do neither disagree nor um, neither agree nor disagree. And then a, a sizable but much smaller group of people um, from the agrees who, who fall on the disagree side of that. So it's to highlight the ways in which we are often coming in with already sort of some negative assumptions about religion as a force in the world and in the, in the modern era. And then we ex explore, I want, I want to highlight that for them because I want them to be as a first step in religious literacy, to be aware of some of their own assumptions and their own experiences of religion and where that comes from. I talk a little bit about how our modern understanding of religion comes out of a particular context from the European enlightenment that created the international system, our understanding of the modern state and so on, the idea of the secular and the religious um, and how that has shaped the international diplomatic sphere and a lot of foreign relations and so on. And then from there, we just, we talk a, a, about what 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 does it mean to bring some religious literacy to your work um, in doing diplomacy? Is it going to be relevant if you're just an economic officer who's who's looking at the economic system and addressing poverty in um, and unemployment in these contexts? Is that is that more for the public affairs folks or the public diplomacy folks um, who are seeking to engage with constituencies in order to um, sort of promote American values and democracy and that kind of thing. And what I'm trying to help them um, develop first and foremost is a curiosity, um, a recognition that in a lot of the countries where they're going to, if not all of the countries where they're going to, religion is important to the people who live there. And it's, um, it's not simply a private affair that's just in the home, that it is um, oftentimes incredibly fundamental to shaping social norms and institutions and political institutions, and yes, even economic institutions and norms and commitments in those contexts. Um, so it's 
not something that that should be ignored, I think, by anybody who's seeking to engage within any of those systems in support of um, in the work of diplomacy. But then secondly, to to encourage within them curiosity. So recognizing that it's always going to be incredibly complex how religion is manifesting, religions are manifesting in any given context, and it's going to be ambivalent, just like that phrase by Dr. Moore that you quoted at the beginning, religion um, can uh, can enhance in powerful ways, both incredibly harmful activities and incredibly peaceful activities. And so, so I want them to under, to develop a curiosity to ask questions, to see how religions are showing up in these really contradictory ways to understand that there's always gonna be contestation and interpretation and disagreement and debate that is taking place within these different religious communities. Um, but to be curious to, to ask and to, to learn more uh, along the way. And I then I try to point them to some sources um, for at least getting um, you know, a foot in the door and being able to understand the, um, the influential religious traditions where they're going to be going in the embassies they're, they're going to be going to. But again, always with that caveat, like you said, where um, you're never going to become an expert on, if you're going to Burma, you're never going to become an expert on Theravada um, Buddhism in Burma, because I know scholars who've been studying this in their entire life, and they'll still say they have a lot to learn. They're a student of it, because these are these are old traditions that are um, constituted by humans, and humans are complex, and they re these religious traditions reflect that complexity. Well, you also talk a lot about um, right-sizing religion, um, and I, I saw a testimony you gave to a congressional panel, and what you said, this is in the context of, you know, U.S. advocacy for religious freedom or freedom of belief, and you say we need to, you know, we, we should not um, underemphasize religion, but in the same time, we should not overemphasize it. We should not conflate religious freedom with, you know, minority rights and human rights. That these concepts can be related, but they are not identical ones. Talk about that if you would. Yeah. So, right sizing religion is a is a term that started to be used in the Religion and Global Affairs Office in the State Department um, when it was led by by Sean Casey. It's a term that Peter Mandeville uses quite a bit. He's now at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and he's written an article about it if anybody wants to um, go further in, in understanding it. But it it reflects what I often found in the world of religious peace building is that I would encounter people who said, oh, that has, this tradition's all about, there, this conflict's all about religion. It's you know, look at Nigeria or look at Israel, Palestine or whatever it is. This is this is because religious people are pushing particular ideas and you can't resolve it because they're using absolutist language and this sort of thing. Or on the other side, um, there would be people who would say this has nothing to do with religion. Israel and Palestine has nothing to do with religion. It's about political power. It's about questions of, of economics. It's about land. Or in Nigeria, you know, this is again about political, it's political instrumentalization of religion, but it's not about religion. And um, my sense, this is what right sizing captures, is that it's not either of those. It's, it's not that it's all about religion, either of those conflicts or any conflicts around the world. Um, but neither does it have nothing to do with religion. So if you were to try to address the conflicts within Israel-Palestine, um, for example, without purely through looking at contestations around sacred space or, you know, quote unquote, some of the explicitly religious issues um, that are in dispute between communities there, you're not going to resolve the full conflict, right? But if you were trying to resolve um, the, the conflicts there without any attention to issues related to religion, then again, you're not gonna resolve the conflict there. So right-sizing religion is again, it's about not being purely a critic of religion or an apologist of religion. It's about not over or under emphasizing the role of religion, but understanding it as fundamentally entangled with political and economic and other social issues and trying to highlight that in order to understand it, precisely that entanglement and how to address it in concert with addressing some of these other political and economic issues. And I do see sometimes in that religious freedom world that sometimes um, 
issues, you know, like the Rohingya um, crisis is one that I use sometimes, or um, the Uyghur crisis and so on, when it's framed exclusively as an issue related to religious freedom, then it can downplay some of the issues related to stealing land, economic interests, political interests, and so on. And so make it more difficult to actually address some, address some of the fundamental drivers of the conflict. So again, that's where I think right-sizing is important in order to ensure that you're creating um, really nuanced and holistic policy solutions to these issues. Well, I know we could probably spend the whole session talking about this particular topic, but just, you know, the, the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. Um, and there's been lots of articles, I'm sure you've seen some of them about just, you know, the, the religious uh, the religious impetus or the religious factor. And I was looking at an article in the New York Times, this was in late December, and the headline was, clergymen are spies, question mark, churches become tools of war in Ukraine. And then the subhead was Ukrainian officials are cracking down on a branch of the Russian Orthodox Church that they describe as a, a subversive force doing the Kremlin's bidding. What would be sort of for people who are trying to, to follow the war in Ukraine and understand if there is a religious dimension to it, how should they think of that? Yeah, so... Um, very timely question. Thank you. There's certainly a religious dimension to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think there's some, some good analysis and articles that are out there that talk about some of the alliances between, for example, Putin and um, the Moscow church um, and the patriarchs. And um, on the Ukraine side, some of the challenges with the with Ukraine, what's called autocephaly or the independence of the Ukraine church from the Moscow church and the ways in which that has um, been fueled by and also fueled the political conflict between um, between Russia and Ukraine that has led to the um, uh, despicable forms of violence and the invasion that we're seeing. And that plays out on this grand scale with some of these formative figures, these heads of institutions, um, like Patriarch Kirill on the, on the Russian side. But there's also, if that's one dimension of it, right? And it's important to understand that dimension because, again, in order to respond in a holistic way to try to support justice and try to support peace, in, in this circumstance, that dimension needs to be taken into account because it, it has fueled um, aspects of the violence, legitimated forms of invasion. Um, and at the same time, it's also far more complex than simply that story of the heads of the institutions um, because there's also uh, in, important questions that need to be asked and dimensions to understand that are far more grassroots. It's not just about how the political leaders are instrumentalizing religion, as was the language that you cited, but it's also about how are every day-to-day -day people um, in Ukraine, for example, which is a very religious context, how are the people there who are being displaced, who are going without heat right now, who are facing forms of, of insecurity and loss and suffering. What is what does religion look like in their life? How are religious institutions, in, including across lines of difference? So the Greek church there um, and the Jewish community and the, the Orthodox community have been aligning in ways to provide humanitarian aid um, to support those who've been displaced, forms of ritual practice that have been useful. There's a really interesting article and study that came out of Harvard several years ago um, that looked at the ways in which quotidian forms of religious ritual and practice are useful to those living in the midst of violence. Um, because when you're facing insecurity, when you're facing forms of trauma, um, you've lost loved ones, you've experienced violence yourself, having daily ritual practices provides a degree of um, predictability in your life that is comforting and that provides psychological and spiritual care. So how are religious traditions and practices providing that kind of support to people on the ground? Um, 
and you know in Russia itself that that narrative of the Russian church is supporting um, the violence is not necessarily reflective of a lot of people who identify within the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia too who are opposing this war sometimes on religious grounds so again that two things one understand the ambivalence of um the Russian Orthodox Church is not just the institution, it's the people who comprise it. And once you start looking at it that way, there's a there's there's a far more complex story to be told about the Russian Orthodox Church and um, Russian Orthodoxy and perspectives towards Ukraine and towards the invasion of Ukraine. And on the Ukrainian side as well, there is that same kind of ambivalence. Um, and asking the questions, understanding religion is not just an institution, but religion is a part of the lived reality of people. And so then beginning to ask questions um, that are also pulling out the ambivalence of religion as a support um, for moving forward, for peace, for justice, for healing, um, as well as still holding the ways in which it's legitimated and fueled some of this political conflict and, and violence. I'll stop there. <laughs> Again, any of these topics, I could go on and on, John. Well, it's a great actually, question. well, actually, with Susie, we had a really interesting question that was emailed in from Professor uh, David Jones from Indiana University. He's mm -hmm. an SIU alum. And he, he notes that in the mid 2010s, he taught international development courses in Bangkok um, and had some terrific international students. And he, he cites one particular student from Myanmar who, who he said was kind, hardworking, and, and a dedicated practicing Buddhist. She was one of my best students. Um, however, she was unalterably dismissive of the Rohingya people in her country, regarding them as a, essentially subhuman. I understand the challenges posed by to her country by Muslim immigrants, real and exaggerated, from na na neighboring Bangladesh. But then he says, still the contrast with her deeply held Buddhist spiritualism in all other regards remains perplexing to me. Can your study of political Buddhism help one better understand this seeming contradiction? Yeah, I mean, not even my study of political Buddhism, but I think the, the biggest lesson for me was again, living and working in a Buddhist country and, and maybe in studying at the, or teaching at the, at the Thai Buddhist institution. Um, Professor Jones saw that too, which is that, Buddhism, like any other religious tradition, is comprised of humans or composed of humans. And humans are complex. And just like with any other religious tradition, you're going to have people who are going to have viewpoints that seem to be in tension with, if not outright contradiction with some of the fundamental norms and values. I mean, it's the same question for me as a Christian, where I, I think, how could this religion of a, a very committed nonviolence um, leader be used to justify the Crusades? How could the, the fundamentally sort of pacifist understanding of Jesus be used to justify incredibly violent campaigns in history? And so we have in the West in particular, I think a kind of romanticized notion of Buddhism as a peaceful religion, Dalai Lama is, you know, maybe the figure who um, stands out to us the most, um, or who we know best, and he embodies that that peaceful, um, those peaceful norms of and teachings within Buddhism. But Buddhism, like all religious traditions, is ambivalent, and so you can look, you know, there's forms of Zen Buddhism that were used to justify militarism, Japanese militarism. Um, there's in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, there's there's modern day um, modern day movements that have drawn on particular Buddhist teachings and understandings to justify forms of violence. On, on the question of the Rohingya in particular, um, I would say this is that my experience when I began working and studying um, in Myanmar and Myanmar Buddhism, is that I found the same kind of thing as there was kind of this dominant mentality among a lot of Buddhists, uh, especially Bamar Buddhists, the, the ethnic majority of suspicion towards Rohingya and not necessarily having sympathy for the experience of um, of oppression that, that they were facing in statelessness because they were not recognized as citizens. Um, when the coup happened, in Myanmar uh, a couple of years ago, it was remarkable to see that there was a shift, a notable shift, not, not you know, 
in everybody, um, but a notable shift in the mentality towards the Rohingya and other ethnic minority groups who have experienced forms of oppression by the military. And you saw a lot of people who you wouldn't have seen on previously who were holding signs during the civil disobedience movement um, for Rohingya rights and, and having a lot more understanding of the forms of violence that they faced at the hands of the military as they were seeing the military um, once again turning their guns on the on them, on, on the Bomar community and other communities as, as a part of that coup. So there's been sort of a groundswell of shift within Myanmar and with, within the democracy movement, within the human rights movement across the different ethnic groups, including the the, the, the majority Bamar community, where there's a I think a, a good deal more sympathy now for the Rohingya and the experiences that they faced and a sense of solidarity with them in the in as part of this sort of anti-military movement now. Right. Very different question from a fellow member of the United Church of Christ. And the question begins with a quote, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, in all things, charity. And the question is, how do you understand this UCC's belief statement to be playing out in our current world? What are the essentials on which we should be unified? What are the non-essentials on which diversity is the watchword? <laughs> Um, oh, that's great. That's such a good UCC question. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing that I that I love about that quote is that it holds both lifting up the importance of recognizing similarities and differences. I think too often with um, well-intentioned interfaith solidarity work, there can be a rush towards wanting to find the common ground and then stay there on that common ground. And I think it's important to, to ensure solidarity, which we need right now in our world, because so many of the challenges that we're facing in any context, including here in the US with, you know, threats to democracy and so on are similar kinds of challenges that are being faced worldwide um, and some of the economic inequalities and climate and, and so on. So we need these solidarity movements and we need to find places of common ground, which can often be that sort of commitment to the good, commitment to justice and so on. But we also need to um, respect and recognize the strength in diversity as well and explore and be curious about that diversity as well. So we can't, even as we come together in solidarity and in the things that we have in common that cannot stop us from recognizing the differences and honoring the difference as well. Because in those differences is where we can actually find ways of moving forward that draw from um, that are both inclusive in the end, because it's taking into account the different priorities and perspectives of others, but also that can help us create a movement that's going to be stronger because it's recognizing the um, particular skill sets, the particular knowledge, the particular strengths that different communities offer. Um, and so it's it's both about recognizing disagreements and, ex and exploring those and honoring those and not just trying to paper over those in order to ensure that we have solidarity that's based on real meaningful relationships and knowing between, between groups of people. But it's also about recognizing those differences for the sake of creating a movement that's going to be stronger by taking advantage of some of those differences where they can be helpful. So just one example, because that's pretty abstract. One example of this is that I, I have found it really useful in as I study Buddhism um, in my scholarship, and I am myself a Christian and a practitioner of Christianity. And one thing that I've found really useful is that Buddhism and Christianity have very sort of different starting places of understanding what violent conflict is. And this is putting it in far too cursory a way, but all generalizations aren't true. With that caveat, um, Christianity tends to focus a great deal on, on, on economic and social and political justice and in institutions and transforming kind of these institutions in the work to create peace. Whereas Buddhism tends to put a lot of focus on, on internal understandings or misunderstandings of the world and psychological commitments that can lead then lead to conflict and to violence and needing to transform some of those internal psychological misunderstandings and attachments. And what I have found really useful is that they're both 
neither one is right or wrong, right? It's, it's, or they're both right in some sense. And that bringing together both the Buddhist understandings of what causes conflict and what needs to be transformed to bring peace and those Christian understandings and commitments can actually lead to a more holistic and potentially impactful approach to peace building by drawing on the strengths and the contributions of both. Well, tell us a little bit about your work as, as, a, as an ordained minister um, in the United Church of Christ. Do you have, do you, at any point in your career, have you done parish work or tell us about, and also the, I, was, I did a little research on, on, on your church and it's, I mean, relatively new, I think it was created in, in 57, has about 800,000 um, uh, congregates from about 5,000 different congregations. So tell us a little bit about um, your work at UCC. Sure. So the United Church of Christ, it was, yes, the, the modern denomination was created in 1957, but that was actually a coming together of four different denominational trends that are far older. So that was, you know, the, the 50s during that period, the light 50s was kind of an ecumenical moment. Um, and so the UCC was born out of that ecumenical moment of these four different denominations, which include the Congregational Church, the Christian Church, the Evangelical, and the Reformed Churches. Um, they were reflective of that ecumenical moment in coming together because they shared a lot of same theological commitments and social commitments. Um, but it's a mainline Protestant tradition. Uh, it's actually, you know, the congregational church are descendants of the Puritans and pilgrims. So a lot of the ways in which the UCC functions is reflective of the ways that the American government functions in some ways where there's elections, there's a form of federalism where individual churches have a lot of autonomy um, to embrace or not the particular decisions that are made at the collective le level through, through, through democratic processes. Um, I have not served as a parish minister. So when I went into this work of religious peace building, I wanted to do it as a minister. I wanted to do it as a person of faith who wanted to work. You know, I didn't want to come into these communities overseas as a quote unquote secular diplomat or U.S. government official who for for whom they are about whom they might have concerns about, especially in post-colonial context, about being politically instrumentalized or a person who's not necessarily going to um, share similar kinds of commitments or, or values and so on. I wanted to, to come in as an ambassador to the world of the US government and, and diplomacy, um, but to, to be able to um, do so as one who like them understands the commitments to, that they have to commit their communities and, and something about what's what's motivating them across religious traditions. So the UCC recognized this work as a ministry, as an ordained ministry of the church, and they ordained me to do this work of religious peace building. Um, but I, so, so I haven't served as a minister at a church, but I do uh, sometimes perform the sacraments. I, I preach, um, I do forms of pastoral care and so on. And again, I've always seen that as one, it's just meaningful work um, that, that ha is, is fundamental to my, my sense of self and my vocation and commitments. Um, but two, it's, it keeps me connected to these, these communities with whom I'm working around the world and what's kind of fundamentally at the heart of what then leads them to become involved in nonviolent movements or to support peace, peace efforts and so on is these relationships of care that they have to others within their community and to, to truth, whatever that looks like within their religious traditions. Okay. Well, Susie, final question for the students who are, are watching. Um, the I like to ask people, so what have you learned in your career? I mean, what would you like to, when you talk to your students at Harvard Divinity School or when you meet with young people, in terms of just how they should think about their careers, how they should organize their lives, how they should pursue their passions? What have you learned? I had one of my mentors tell me when I decided I wanted to study religion and I was like, well, what is studying? Really? Where's that going to lead me? Like, am I, am I going to just be a minister? I don't think I want to be a minister. Um, what can you do with the study of religion? And that mentor said, if you're passionate about it, you'll figure it out. Something, your passion is what will drive you, not, not purely logical decisions about what's, what's going to be the most viable option for you. And, um, and so I sort of trusted that and, and study religion and it, and it, 
and it did allow me to develop a career. So I would first and foremost, just encourage students to follow their passions and, um, and trust that it will lead somewhere that brings you a vocation of meaning. Because if you don't have a vocation of meaning, if you're just doing a job, then, then it's, can be really hard to get through the day. Um, so that, and then I would also say the importance of, um, of building relationships, because in all of this work to be effective, for me as a peace builder to be effective at the end of the day, it wasn't necessarily about being able to sort of create the precise right programmatic design. It was about the relationships and it was about in, in being transparent, inviting in inviting the kinds of relationships that um, inculcate trust on which different efforts can be built. So from the get-go, building relationships of integrity and trust and, um, and doing that will, will end up opening a lot of doors for you down the lines too, um, professionally and so on, because getting in these positions you want to, it's often based on the relationships you have. Well, thank you so much for really a terrific conversation. We could obviously go on for a couple hours if uh, if yeah. circumstances allow. So, but but thank you so much. It's been really interesting to follow your work, and um, and we'd like to uh, we'll have to talk some more about maybe co uh, enticing you to Carbondale, maybe sometime when you're traveling between Boston and Minneapolis and meeting with students here and giving perhaps a talk to a class or community members. Because I think that the topics you're talking about are so important and so interesting and and so kind of applicable to all of our lives. I would love that. Thank you, John. Thank you for your warmth. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. It was fun. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for joining another edition of our series. We will have this video on YouTube in the next couple of days. Please look at it, show it to family and friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute, keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.